All right, so for this week's Challenge Wednesday, y'all ready for this? Are y'all 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 seriously ready to get this job done? Did you put your answer put your answers down, man? You got to do it. All right. For this week's Challenge Wednesday, we have Zane, and Zane presents with complaints of deep anterior shin pain that started approximately 3 months ago. The patient states that the discomfort is present during running activities, descending stairs, and at night when resting. During an examination, the patient has localized tenderness but no changes in ankle mobility. Which of the following conditions is the most likely present? So we have A, acute compartment syndrome, B, anterior shin splints. We got C, which is a stress fracture, and D, which is common peroneal nerve compression. All right, so let's go into this one. Y'all, it's going to be very important that you, you really focus on this whole shin pain deal. All right? Don't take this one for granted because a lot of times we'll get these questions about shin pain. You got to differentially diagnose it, determine if it's a stress fracture versus shin splints and acute compartment, all these different things. And if you don't understand that neuromusculoskeletal differential, you're going to struggle with this area. So I'm going to teach you how to break a question like this down. We start off at the top. We see Zane presents with complaints of deep anterior shin pain. All right, so I'm starting off with that. I know the patient has complaints of this deep anterior shin pain. Of course, that could be a few different things. We at least have the location of that. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, read through that entire sentence. It says, started approximately three months ago. Now, just off that first sentence, pretty straightforward, anterior shin pain that's deep approximately three months ago. It's not telling us something about trauma right now, right? It's not telling us how this thing got started. It's just saying approximately three months ago. So I'm keeping that in mind. Now, as I continue down, it says the patient states that the discomfort is present during running activities. All right, and I'll stop there for a second. Discomfort that is present during running activity. So what's happening to the body as we're running? I mean, you gotta think about that impact, right? You gotta think about the repetitive loading that's going on. So can that start to create some pathologies? For sure it can, all right? Um, are you starting to think about something specific, right? So let's hold on to that. We're not there just yet. Let's look at the next one. It says descending stairs. All right, and as I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about the muscles that are involved in it. Um, there's quite a few muscles, but if we look at down at the below the knee area, we're thinking about the dorsiflexors are responsible for, you know, slowly, you know, controlling that foot down to the next step. Uh, you can even even get some isometric slash eccentric action going on there. Uh, we got some gas strocks on the, the leg that stays at the top step that's lowering us down because the gas strock has to eccentrically allow for dorsiflexion. Again, I'm talking about the leg that would stay at the top step while the other leg goes down. Um, so there's a few different things that we're thinking there. But one particular thing I'm thinking about is what happens when that foot that goes down the stairs, it hits the next step? Like, isn't that impact as well? I mean, aren't we getting some impact there? So I would say so. I'm thinking about that because running activities is impact is, is, as well, all right? Uh, as we continue down that uh, uh, statement there, it says, and at night when resting. So the patient is having pain during running, pain during descending the stairs, and at night when resting. And that's important too. The patient's not even moving around and they're still experiencing pain. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff in this question for me to like utilize to answer the question. Let's go down to the next one. It says, during an examination, the patient has localized tenderness, but no changes in ankle mobility. And I believe that that sentence also tells me a lot because, I mean, there, not every pathology is localized tenderness, y'all. And we'll go into that in a bit when we look at the answer choices. But also, it says that there's no changes in ankle mobility. So I'm thinking, well, there must not be anything wrong with the capsule. I mean, even from a muscle standpoint, if the muscle was a problem and it was tight, that would limit ankle mobility. And I'm not really seeing that. So already, I mean, this question here has given me a lot to go off of. 
Okay. And so the last sentence of the question, it says, which of the following conditions is the most likely present? And so what we're doing is a differential diagnosis eval type question. For those of you on the podcast, let me go through the answer choice again. We got A is acute compartment syndrome. B is a anterior shin splints. C is stress fracture. D is common peroneal nerve compression. So let's knock these out one by one. Acute compartment syndrome. Are you familiar with that one? You better be for the MPTE now. Okay, so this condition is usually trauma-based. And I'm not just talking about repetitive trauma or anything like that. I'm actually talking about like a severe traumatic accident, like a motor vehicle accident, falling off a ladder and, you know, breaking your leg, something along the lines of that. Uh, Acute compartment syndrome is when there's a buildup of pressure inside the anterior compartment of the lower leg. Well, when we got this buildup of pressure, the patient starts to have the sensation of heaviness and fullness and tightness in that lower leg. They start to complain of things like numbness and tingling potentially. One of the things that's special about that condition is that the patient oftentimes won't have a dorsal pedal artery pulse. All right, we'll say that's five times fast. Dorsal pedal artery pulse. If you go to check it, a lot of times they don't have it. Why? Because of that buildup of pressure is pressing on the blood vessel, not allowing the blood to flow very well. So one thing I also know about anterior compartment syndrome is it is a medical emergency. All right. So do you believe that that's the the description I just gave to you right now? Do you believe that that's what our patient's dealing with? I would say, "Mm, I don't know about that. I mean, it says that the the shin pain started three months ago. Listen, acute uh, compartment syndrome is a medical emergency. There's no way that this patient has like this acute compartment syndrome that's lasting that long. I mean, if if it's truly an acute compartment syndrome, because what's going to happen is they're going to have the lack of blood flow or the blood flow restriction and potentially permanent damage that starts to set in. There's no way that this patient is just going on for three months, you know, with this type of condition going on. Okay. And so what I would do is automatically put an X next to that. But as we go down the line, there's other stuff, other stuff that would rule out acute compartment syndrome, things like no changes in ankle mobility. Well, that definitely is going to happen. The muscles are going to be very reactive to this problem. A lot of times they will possibly go into like a, a spasm and, and the patient will even complain of pain if you try to stretch the ankle at all. So I would expect ankle mobility to be impaired. So I'm going to go ahead and mark that one out. Doesn't look like a good answer there. Let's go to B. B says anterior shin splints. All right, so anterior shin splints, we all know that that's a pretty common condition. All right, we can have them on the posterior side of the leg, uh, but we also can have them on the anterior If you ever have a patient with anterior shin splints, it's usually something repetitive that they've been doing, something over, like an overuse condition related to the anterior tibialis. We're overusing that muscle. Now, can you get it from running? Yes, you can. I mean, you can get it really from any activity that's calling for the anterior tib to do a lot of activity and where you're overusing it, okay? And so... Here's the deal. Is that consistent with the clinical picture? Well, the patient can have definitely anterior shin pain with shin splints. That makes sense. They they could have started three months ago, so that makes sense. I like that. The discomfort present during running activities. Well, can we get shin splints during running activities? Well, here's the deal. About shin splints, it's really interesting. That when you're starting the activity, like the warm-up, the patient usually complains of pain, right? And then after they start exercising a bit, the pain tends to go away. And then as they cool down, they stop the exercise and they cool down, the pain comes back again. Well, that's not what is being said in this question at all. It says discomfort is present during running activities, descending stairs, and at night uh, when resting. And that's not consistent with anterior shin splints. I don't like that one. All right. Uh, But here's the other deal. It says the patient has localized tenderness. Well, the one thing I know about shin splints, it's it tends to be diffuse tenderness, like greater than a five centimeter area. That's how they usually define it in your text is greater than a five centimeter area. It's more diffuse pain, not localized. All right. 
And so again, I'm looking at all these different characteristics and I'm like, this is not consistent with shin splints. One last thing, y'all, one last. It says, but no changes in ankle mobility and I would expect the person to have limited plantar flexion with anterior shin splints. Why? Because that anterior tib is, 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 is irritated. And so if you go to try to stretch it, you're not going to get very much motion because the patient's potentially going to be painful. All right. And so B don't like it. Not a good answer. It just doesn't fit with the clinical picture. Let's look at C. C says stress fracture. For those of you who are unfamiliar with a stress fracture, it's a small bone fracture. A lot of times we can't even find that thing when we use an x-ray on it. All right. In the earlier phases, we, we can't even find it. All right. It's very small. Um, they often call this a stress reaction. We get this because of some repetitive loading that the patient's doing, like running, all right? Jumping, running, all those things can create a stress fracture. Now, can we get it during running? That's, yep, definitely can. Can we get it during uh, descending stairs as far as like the pain? Can it be present during descending stairs? I say yes, because if you're loading that leg, if that leg's coming down to the step and you're striking with that heel or whatnot, yeah, that could light up a stress fracture for sure. It caused pain. Here's the deal. Does that happen at night where the patient gets pain while resting at night? Mm. Do you know that one? You should be saying absolutely. Stress fractures are definitely something that the patient can complain of um, at night, like as far as the pain being there even if they're at rest, all right? And so all these things make sense. But let me go to this one sentence. It says, during an examination, the patient has localized tenderness. Guess what, y'all? Put this down in your notes. Stress fractures tend to have pain that is less than five centimeters in length, all right? That's how they define localized tenderness. So yeah, stress fractures have localized tenderness and I wouldn't really expect changes in ankle mobility. I really wouldn't because the stress fracture doesn't really have anything to do with the muscle itself or the tendon or the capsule or anything along the lines of that. Listen, stress fracture looks like the best freaking answer here right now. It just fits this clinical picture. All right, so I'll put a check mark next to it. Doesn't mean it's the right answer. Let's look at D. D says common peroneal nerve compression. This is one I'm going to eliminate pretty quickly. And I'm going to eliminate it because, yes, the patient can have anterior shin pain with a common peroneal nerve compression. But think about it. When we compress a nerve, what type of signs and symptoms do we primarily start to see? Numbness and tingling, right? Numbness and tingling, potentially burning, these types of symptoms. Well, in the question, I'm not getting any vibe that we're having a neuro-related condition right now. All right? I really would expect those paresthesias, the numbness and tingling and all of that. Um, common peroneal nerve compression, can you see it with running activities or discomfort? Potentially. All right? You can see it getting worse with that. Uh, the descending stairs is kind of weird and the pain at night with resting. Yeah, you could potentially see that. But bottom line, what I'm telling you right now is since I do not see any nerve related, you know, symptoms, signs or symptoms, I'm going to go ahead and eliminate that one. All right. And then we get out D leaving us with our final answer of stress fracture. Hundred freaking percent. If it's the cl cl clinical picture, the best. I mean, when you look at it, deep shin pain. Um, it could start gradually over time after a person's like repetitively loading the limb with running or jumping or something like that. It can have pain at night. All right. One thing I want you to make sure that you write down in your notes is the patient tends to not have changes in mobility. They don't. But one thing that they do have is localized tenderness. And that's how I differentiate shin splints from a stress fracture because shin splints they're going to have diffuse pain greater than five centimeters in length. Stress fracture is going to have localized pain less than five centimeters in length. That's something you need to know for the exam. All right, so congratulations to those of you who got this one correct. I know this was a lot to understand. If you pulled over on the side of the road or if you stopped your treadmill to kind of listen to what I was saying, I completely understand you, baby. You might not be knowing that because the coronavirus is out right now, so your gym's probably closed and all that good stuff, but... 
That is besides the point. Listen, I don't ever want to leave you with that basic explanation. I always want to take you to the next level. And how I'm going to do that is by getting you a cheat sheet to help you with these differential diagnosing of these conditions. Yeah, anterior compartment, shin splints, stress fractures. I got a cheat sheet that's going to help you to go over the stuff that we went over here today. All right, sounds good. So if you're on the podcast right now, I want you to go into your show notes, click the link in there. This is one of my fire cheat sheets right there. So go into the show notes and get it.